before we start. Just make a short prayer before we start. In the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, Amen. Good morning, Abba Father. Good morning, Holy Spirit. Good morning, Jesus. Good morning, Mother Mary. Lord, Jesus, thank you for gathering us together once again on this beautiful morning. Thank you for the gift of life. Thank you for giving us good health, food on the table, a roof over our heads and providing us with all that we need, Lord. Lord, thank you for protecting us with your precious blood, Lord. Protect all of us present here every day, Lord, with your precious blood. Lord, bless all of us present here on this platform who wake up daily in the morning, Lord, early in the morning to come to gather together, Lord, in prayer to worship you and to give you thanks. Bless all of them and their family members, Lord, present on this platform and all those who would be listening. Lord, I pray that you will open my mouth, proclaim your word in the power of the Spirit, Lord, and pray that the same Spirit will open the hearts of its hearers, Lord, assemble here to receive your holy gospel and to write it on the good soil of their hearts. We ask that you would open our ears so that we may hear your voice, Lord, Open our minds so that we may receive your eternal wisdom, Lord, your knowledge, Lord. Open our spirits so that we may know your leading and your guidance. And open our hearts so that we may receive your wonderful love, Lord. Lord, I thank you that you have already won the victory, Lord, because of your death on the cross. Satan's fate has been sealed. Thank you for equipping and enabling us to resist the devil's attack. Thank you for your word that you can expose our own sinful desires and refute the lies of the devil. Help us to stand firm, rooted in faith, shielded by your armor and dependent on your grace, Lord. Heavenly Father, as we are coming to the end of our series on spiritual warfare, help us, your warriors, to prepare for battle with all that we have learned, Lord, on all these sessions, Lord. Today is the second last session, Lord. Today we claim victory over Satan by putting on the whole armor of God, Lord. All of us present here today on this session, Help us to put on the belt of truth, Lord. May we stand firm in the truth of your word so that we will not be victims of Satan's lies. We put on the breastplate of righteousness. May it guard our hearts from evil so that we may remain pure and holy, protected under the blood of Jesus Christ. We put on the shoes of peace, Lord. May we stand firm in the good news of the gospel so that your peace will shine through all of us present here and be a light to all we encounter. We take the shield of faith. May we discern Satan's fiery darts of doubt and deceit so that we will not be vulnerable to the spiritual defeat. We put on the helmet of salvation. May we keep our mind focused on you so Satan will not have a stronghold on our thoughts, Lord. We take the sword of the spirit. May the two-edged sword of your word be ready in our hands at all times so that we can expose the tempting words of Satan. By faith, we, your warriors, your soldiers, Lord, have put on the whole armor of God and we are prepared to live this day in spiritual victory. Help us to resist the devil daily, Lord. We make this prayer in the name of the one who crushed the head of the serpent, our Lord Jesus Christ. Amen, amen, and amen. So brothers and sisters, uh, as we go ahead with this uh, second last series, uh, day of the series on spiritual warfare, so are any of you in a, a battle, facing any battle today, or is it taking more than just a physical toll on you? So are you finding it difficult to find the words to tell the devil to be gone? So spiritual warfare is crippling and it's real and it's troublesome, but Jesus has already won us the victory. And we know that the devil is a defeated enemy, but we need to know how he attacks us. Now that we have learned so much in these last eight sessions, so we put on the whole armor of God that we may be able to stand against the schemes of the devil. So we do not wrestle against flesh and blood like we learn, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the cosmic powers over the present darkness, against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly places. So as Christians, we are constantly in a spiritual battle of some sort or the other on a daily basis. And in warfare, battles are fought on different fronts for different reasons and with varying degrees of intensity. 
so the same is true in spiritual warfare our spiritual battles and warfare are real even though we cannot physically see the attacker so there are forces both angelic and demonic that are actively working around us so there is evil that we fight in our spiritual uh, warfare so jesus told us to pray for god's will to be done on earth as it is in heaven so he told us that the gates of hell will not prevail against the work that god has a purpose for us to accomplish and his will is being worked out in our lives so we need to understand that the battle is not against flesh and blood like i said before but against the powers not against our brothers and sisters or our friends family members no it's against the powers in the heavenly places so as we begin to get the revelation of the spiritual warfare we will begin to understand how the enemy moves against us in the physical realm so the battles of spiritual warfare are intense when a person decides to accept jesus as their savior so the minute we start to accept jesus as our savior and we're getting the enemy will attack from all angles so hoping to dissuade us or to stop stop the person from fully giving their heart to jesus so that's what he does he doesn't want us to get close to jesus he doesn't want us to you know make jesus our lord god and savior so he will use circumstances events people things and even doubt in their minds to steal their hearts back to his wicked ways so these types of battles are fought in the world but involve us uh, spiritual forces of darkness that exist in the invisible realm around us so we will just recap on what we learned in the last eight sessions and uh, we should have all by hearted our key scripture by now which is ephesians 6:12 uh which says that our struggle is not against flesh and blood but against the rulers against the authorities against the powers of this dark world and against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly realms so in our first part of the series we learned about the two realms that were there and uh, we learned about the two kingdoms who is the devil satan the ruler of the world jesus the savior of the world and we learned how to repent and be baptized be baptized in christ that was romans chapter 6 uh, verse 3 to 4 and we also learned that satan is a defeated enemy which he is so that that's what we have to always keep in mind that we don't give him too much importance we know that he is a defeated enemy but we also have to know how he how he penetrates and how he comes and he he tempts us so that's what we have to know so that is the that is uh, what uh, we have to know about satan that he is a defeated enemy and in the part 2 we learn that the how important the blood of christ is and how we obtain forgiveness through that blood of christ and how the blood releases us from the legal indebtedness and how the blood lets us approach god so there is power in the blood and we also learn the power of the enemy he does have power but although he is a defeated enemy he does has have power because we allow him to get that power and we also learn the names of the devil the names that he the various names that he's called in the bible so and in part 3 we learned about these rulers these authorities the powers of the dark world the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly realms how demons work and how they are so united and like us they have different levels of wickedness and they have different functions how do these affect us and how do these infiltrate and lastly we were warned against the te- uh, against the teachings of false prophets like in 1 timothy 4 chapter 1 so we also have we also have to know how the de- devil works so that's what we learned then in part 4 we learned about that we how we do not love the world or the things of the world because the world or the things of the world have a way of you know dragging us back onto all these wicked things into sin so we learned that uh, what jesus came to save us save the world and to destroy the devil's works we also learn how to renew our minds and that's what we need to do every daily renew our minds so that we can keep satan out renew our minds with the word of god and feed our spirit how to remain in jesus keep our eyes focused on jesus and how to feed ourselves with good food in part 5 we learned how to build defenses how to uh, how the, there are blocks to our prayers being answered about selfishness sinfulness unforgiveness hard heartedness disrespect to wife self righteousness and prideful arrogance doubt 
unitedness in Christ's, uh, Christ's body. So all these things we learned, which are not... Uh, so in part six, we learned about the armor of God that compromised the belt of truth, the breastplate of righteousness, the gospel shoes, the shield of faith, the helmet of salvation, the sword of the spirit, which is the word of God and the weapon of prayer. So prayer is another powerful weapon. Part seven, we learned about offensive warfare and defensive warfare, how we always need to fight our battles on the offensive. And if for an army to achieve victory, it has to be on the offenses, offensive. How to demolish strongholds, how to reprogram our mind, how we can bind and lose, stand our ground, speak the word, learn to abide. Then we learn the various types of strongholds, unconfessed sin, breaking the stronghold of sin, unforgiveness, breaking the stronghold of unforgiveness, how we ought to deal in the occult, breaking the stronghold of occult influence and lies that you have believed. In the last part that we uh, did last week, we learned how demons gain access to the mind-altering substances. Then we learn how to also negate the effect of that. We learn the antidote for that. Mind control teaching, participation in the occult, generational sins, Environment, depression, discouragement, emptiness, fear, guilt, inferiority, pride, hatred, and you know how to guard ourselves. So today, as always, a lot of scripture is going to be quoted and that you'll understand that the subject matter is rooted in the word of God. So whenever you come across all these quotations, take a moment to read them in your Bible. So the full context will give you a better understanding of the verses quoted. So this is particularly important. Uh, given the subject of spiritual warfare, because the word of the, of God is the sword of the spirit and we need to both know how to wield it and if we are to win our spiritual battles. So I hope you'll have your Bibles uh, open. So we are coming to the end of our series on spiritual warfare and today and in the next week, we are going to look at how to bind the spirits that trouble us so that they don't trouble us any longer. And in our next session, we are going to look specifically at self-deliverance de so that we are able to make sure that we live free lives, not just for a brief period of time, but for the remainder of our life. So today, we, I'm going to talk about the various demonic influences that affect us and affect those around us and how to recognize them. And it's only when we recognize them that we are going to be able to take steps to combat them. So how do we recognize the presence of demons? So there are specific manifestations that take place when there is a demonic influence. So if there are more than two or three of these symptoms, it is reasonably certain that we might need deliverance. So however, we should properly discern if these manifestations are in fact spiritual in nature. So there are certain mental ailments that could be confused for spiritual afflictions. And I cannot overstress the danger of telling people who are mentally ill that they are being demonized. So with that clarified, let us read a passage from scripture that is very powerful, not just in the lesson it teaches, teaches us about demons, but also in several other lessons that it provides to, to us about spirituality and the spiritual life. So let us open our Bibles to Mark chapter 5, verses 1 to 20. Sister, can you read Mark chapter 5, verses 1 to 20? sister. Thank you, sister. Amen. See, it's a, it's a long passage, but it's very powerful. So, we just read the passage. Yes, sister. Sure. Jesus hails the girls in Dominion. They came to the other side of the sea, to the country of the Gerasenes. And when he had stepped out of the boat, immediately a man out of the tombs with an unclean spirit met him. He lived among the tombs, and no one could restrain him any more, even with the chain, for he had often been restrained with the shackles and chains, but the chains he wrenched apart, and the, sh and the shackles he broke in pieces, and no one had the strength to subdue him. Night and day, among the tombs and on the mountains, he was always howling and bruising himself with stones. When he saw Jesus from a distance, he ran and bowed down before him, and he shouted at the top of his voice, What have you to do with me, Jesus, son of the most high God? I adjure you by God, do not torment me. 
for he had said to him, Come out of the man, you unclean spirit. Then Jesus asked him, What's your name? He replied, My name is Legion, for we are many. He begged him earnestly not to send them out of the country. Now there on the hillside, a great herd of swine was feeding. And the unclean spirits begged him, Send us into the swine, let us enter them. So he gave them permission, and the unclean spirits came out and entered the swine, and the herd numbering about 2,000 rushed down the steep bank into the sea and were drowned in the sea. The swine herds ran off and told it in the city and in the country. Then people came to see what it was that had happened. They came to Jesus and saw the demoniac sitting there, clothed and in his right mind, the very man who had had the legion, and they were afraid. Those who had seen what had happened to the demoniac and to the swine reported it. Then they began to beg Jesus to leave their neighborhood. As he was getting into the boat, the man who had been possessed by demons begged him that he might be with them. But Jesus refused and said to him, Go home to your friends and tell them how much the Lord has done for you and what mercy he has shown you. And he went away and began to proclaim in the Decapolis how much Jesus had done for him. And everyone was amazed. This is the gospel of the Lord. Amen. Amen. Yes. So thank you. Thank you, sister. So in this passage, uh, this uh, so before we move on to the main uh, subject, let us... Uh, you know, mind the story for what it teaches us. So in this in this passage, it says that uh, uh, Jesus uh, and his apostles went across the lake to the region of the Gersamine. And when Jesus got out of the boat, a man with an impure spirit came out from the tombs to meet him. So this man had been living in the tombs and no one could bind him anymore. Like he was that strong. They couldn't tie him anymore, not even with a chain. So because he had often been chained, uh, chained uh, hand and foot, and he tore the chains apart. So that much was his strength. And the iron, so no one was strong enough to subdue him, to keep him down. So night and day among the tombs and the hills, he would cry out and cut himself with stones. So when he saw Jesus in a distance, he ran and he fell on his knees in front of him. So that is what the presence of Jesus did to demons. So they ran, ran and they fell on their knees in front of him. And he shouted at the top of his voice, and he asked Jesus, so what do you want from me, Jesus, the son of the most high God? He even recognized Jesus. So when he was telling Jesus in God's name, don't torture me. So Jesus had said to him, come out of this man, you impure spirit. So Jesus just commanded uh, the impure spirit to come out of that man. And he asked him, what's your name? So he said, my, and the, these demons have names also. He said, my name is Legion. And he said that we are many of us, not one demon, but many of us. And he begged Jesus again and again not to send them out of the area. So a large herd of pigs was fleeing to a nearby hillside and the demons begged Jesus to send them among the pigs so to allow us to get into them. So he gave them permission and the impure spirits came out and went into the pigs. And that herd, about 2,000 in number, rushed down the steep bank into the lake and were drowned. So those tending the pigs ran off and reported this in the town and countryside and the people went out to see what had happened. So when they had come to Jesus, they saw the man had been possessed by the legion of demons. So sitting there dressed on in his right hand and they were afraid. So those who had seen it told the people what had happened about the, of the demon possessed man. So the people began to plead with Jesus to leave that region. As Jesus was getting into the boat, the man who had been demon possessed begged to go with him. So Jesus did not let him, but said, go home to your own people and tell them how much the Lord has done for you and how he has had mercy on you. So Jesus wanted him to go back and tell his own people. So the man went away and began to tell in the Decapolis. So the Decapolis is a large area, you know, east and south, and it is a it, it is made up of 10 cities. So the area is the Golan Heights, like, you know, towards Jordan and southwest towards Syria. So it's a legion of 10, a league of 10 cities, including Damascus. So how much uh, had Jesus, so he wanted him to go and tell how much Jesus had done for him and all the people were amazed. So before we move to this main subject, uh, this one of the demons who Jesus, so the first point is that the demons know who Jesus is in this whole verse. 
the first point is that the demons know who Jesus is. So what do you want with me, Jesus, son of the most high God, they asked. So they knew Jesus. And the second point is that they recognize his absolute power over them. So these demons, they recognize the absolute power of Jesus over them and his ability to cast them out and where to send them. The third point is that they know there is an appointed time for their end. So in Matthew's version of the story, they ask, have you come here to torment us before the time? So see that in, in Matthew chapter 8, verse 26. Can we read Matthew chapter 8, verse 29? Yes, sister. Matthew 8, 29. Suddenly they shouted, what have you to do with us, son of God? Have you come here to torment us before the time? Thank you, sister. So there, these, the third point is that these demons, they know there is an appointed time for their end. And in this version of the gospel, they said, they asked him, have you come here to torment us before the time? And the fourth point is that the demons don't like roaming around without the habitation of, live, of a living host. So basically, they need someone to, you know, a living host. So it explains that what Jesus meant when he spoke about how demons go through arid places without finding rest. So if the place is empty, they don't find rest, but they need that living host. A person, you know, to come and make their home with. So if you look at Matthew chapter 12, verse 43 also, that's what it says. So sister, can you read Matthew chapter 12, verse 43? Yes, sister. Matthew 12, 43. Uh, when the unclean spirit has gone out of a person, it wanders through waterless regions, looking for a resting place but it finds none. Amen. Thank you, sister. So here we see in this, in this verse that it says that uh, they are like these demons once they leave the person and they go around looking, uh, you know, for a place to find rest. And so that's when they make a living host their place of rest. So the fifth point is that they couldn't see what would happen because they know that the pigs would go running into the sea. So they wouldn't they, they couldn't see what would happen because had they known that the pigs would go running into the sea, they wouldn't have asked Jesus to cast them, you know, into these pigs. So we'll pick up, uh, we'll pick uh, up the other lessons in our study. So as we go ahead. So the, the first point is uh, how, do, how do we recognize these uh, demons? The presence of demons uh, is that... Uh, the, they have violent behavior and they have got incredible strength. So that, that's the first point, violent behavior and incredible strength. So uncontrolled behavior usually accompanied by incredible physical strength signifies demonic manifestation. So if a person is demon possessed, you know, you know when they, when they got really, you know, they're really strong and they can fight back. So we see this evidence in the man in the uh, Jerasmi. So the strength possibly came from having a multiple demons. He said that his name is Legion and he had multiple demons. So a Legion compromised between 3,000 and 6,000 foot soldiers in the Roman army. So this is the Roman army that we are talking about where a Legion compromised between 3,000 and 6,000 foot soldiers. So when the spirit said, my name is Legion for we are many, he spoke of a large group of demons inhabiting the man. So while it is impossible that 3,000 spirits were influencing this man, it was still undoubtedly a significant number because they succeeded in panicking 2,000 pigs. So the question is, the question is, how do, how do they come to this number? Give me one moment, please. So, so while it is improbable that 3,000 spirits were influencing this man, it was still undoubtedly significant because they succeeded in panicking 2,000 pigs. So the question is, how did they so many get control? So we have already seen how when an impure spirit comes out of a person, it goes to arid places seeking rest and does not find it. So then it says, I will return to the house I left. When it arrives, sister, can you read Matthew chapter 12, verses 43 to 45? Yes, sister. Thank you, sister. 
Matthew 12, 43. When the unclean spirit has gone out of a person, it wanders through waterless regions, looking for a resting place, but it finds none. Then it says, I will return to my house from which I came. When it comes, it finds it empty, swept, and put in order. Then it goes and brings along seven other spirits, more evil than itself. And they enter and live there. And the last state of that person is worse than the first. So will it be also with this evil generation? Amen. Amen. Thank you, Horish. But so I'll just give you an example here. It's, it's like a person who's like, you know, uh, who's being possessed by demons and who's having a lot of these possessions and they go for a retreat. So when they go for a retreat and they spend like one week in the retreat center, so when they come back, they come back anointed and, you know, they come back cleansed. They felt that the demons have left them. But when they come back to the world and they go back to their worldly things and they don't renew their mind and they get back to all their old activities, then these demons uh, come back with like seven more. So, you know, they're, the person who's gone for that retreat gets back to being worse than what they were before. So that's how what happens, like, you know, when we are cleansed and then we, we go back to our worldly things, we forget about renewing our mind, we forget about not committing sin, we go back and commit those sins again and again. So that's when the demons come back. So it says we have, uh, we have seen that this impure spirit comes out of a person and goes to arid places seeking rest and does not find it. Then it says, I will return to the house I left. So the house I left could be that person who has been completely cleansed. So when it arrives, it finds that the house unoccupied swept clean and put in order then it goes and takes with it seven other spirits more wicked than itself and then they go and live it so the final condition of that person is worse than the first so consequently many spirits can exercise control over us however for so many demons to take control there could have to be other things in play and the occult is most likely the cause so when we play around with these auja boards, these sciences and these astrology, crystal balls, palm reading, tarot cards and the like, and are unable to stop, it is pretty certain that demons, note the plural, it's, the, it's not demon, demons have gained control. So that's why we have to be very careful as to what we are, you know, uh, interfering with and what we are putting our hands to. So another, another point to note how these demons come into us is a self-destructive or suicidal behavior. So if someone is having self-destructive or suicidal behavior, so we all have an instinct for self-preservation. Uh, so however, when inflicted with demonic influence, <clears throat> we can become self-destructive. So sometimes when a, people, a person possessed can become self-destructive. So the man in our story is uh, this guy called Legion would have cut himself with stones. He was cutting himself with stones. So we do things that get us suspended from school, kicked out of college, and we lose our jobs or families or even our lives. So rage is often the reason we engage in these patterns. So after the incident, the person will often speak about how they don't know what happened and how they simply lost control. So basically, when these demons are in, in possession, they, the person doesn't know what they are doing. They have lost control. So they, they may not be lying. They might have, you know, ceded control to the demon of anger for those few minutes. So we need to bind and cast these spirits out. So another way that the demons can attack us are in attacks in our sleep. So, you know, these demons normally attack us in our sleep. So sometimes people have frequent nightmares. They are another sign that we might be under attack. So these nightmares are often violent, you know, bloody or sexual. So if anybody is anybody's getting these nightmares, you know, they should be you know, under the awareness that the, there may be demons attacking them. So in these dreams, we are often hunted like prey, haunt, haunted by evil creatures, you know, or grotesque faces like these horrible faces or tortured by other frightening visions. So in more serial or uh, rarer attacks, we can be seduced or sexually assaulted by supernatural entities. You know, it's called succubus a female de demon believing to have sexual intercourse with sleeping men or in a female form or in cubis, a male demon believing to have sexual intercourse with sleeping women. <clears throat> so in male form, so disturbance from these demons can cause fatigue, which is sometimes worse than sleeplessness. 
sometimes people have these dreams in the night and they are screaming in their dreams and shouting sometimes there even excess alcohol drug addiction and all these people get these nightmares you know and they scream in their sleep and they talk in their sleep and they are like fighting with people in their sleep so this disturbance from these demons can you know cause fatigue which sometimes worse than sleeplessness so night terrors are also called sleep terrors and it's a sleep disorder causing feelings of panic and dread that typically occur during the first hours of you know stage 3 to 4 non rapid eye movement sleep that is a nrem sleep and can last for about 1 to 10 minutes so it can last longer especially in children so although med- medical science will deny there are often uh, these are often spiritual in nature so these uh, sleep patterns also sometimes we take medicines for all this but sometimes it could be a demonic att- attack so we need to you know how to uh, how to judge what we are facing in that in these things so there also could be heaviness or depression or fear so the fourth point is heaviness depression and fear so sometimes constant heaviness depression and fear are also signs of demonic oppression so they, they may be treated either medically or spiritually see because they can lead to severe consequences if left unintended so one of the best antidotes to despair is praise so praising god is one of the best ways that you can get these demons out you know put on praise and worship or keep singing so god has given us a garment of praise instead of a spirit of despair if you read in sister can you read isaiah chapter 61 verse 3 yes sister Sixty one three, sixty one three. Isaiah sixty one verse three. To provide for those who mourn in Zion, to give them a garland instead of ashes, the the oil of gladness instead of mourning, the mantle of praise instead of a faint spirit. They will be called oaks of righteousness, the planting of the Lord to display His glory. Amen. Amen. So here, the scriptures. It's a powerful scripture. Even if you have a headache, you can claim the scripture, and you know you can praise and worship when you have a headache. So the with this garment of praise, your headache will go away. So always remember, it's of taking tablets. Praise God when you have a headache, and that will that will make the devil flee. So God has given us this garment of praise instead of a spirit of despair. And engaging in frequent vocal praise will lift the heaviness. that weighs us down so if you are having a heavy head it will lift that heaviness and you know that that's weighing us down so another point is the intense un- uncontrollable urges so basically all addictions fall into this category like drug addiction uh, smoking drinking so how do you know if you are an addict if you are okay not having something or doing something especially when you are accustomed to having or doing it so for instance you might not drink every day but if you find yourself drinking heavily on the weekend weekends it is a sign of a spiritual influence so there can be other addictions that often are recognized as addictions like you know constantly being on social media that could also be an addiction or basically chatting on whatsapp that could also be an addiction or watching television that could also be an addiction so try not doing these things for a day or even for limited periods and see if life continues as usual so you can test yourself for it, these addictions if you want to know if you are an addict if you are if you drink every day and suddenly if you stop you can see if you having any withdrawal symptoms or then you'll come to know whether you know you're having an uncontrollable urge to get, have these substances so same goes with like you know being on social media chatting on whatsapp watching television try not doing these things for a day or even for limited periods and see if life continues as usual or if you find yourself compulsively drawn to these activities so the best way to cast out these demons is by starving them so for instance if you are addicted to social media don't get on it for a week and you will find the influence diminishing so sometimes we have this habit of keeping our phones on at all times you know and it's very difficult to uh, put your phone down i know the devil comes a lot through the phone like even for me the thing is i try to read the word of god sometimes but then it automatically since we are doing everything on our phone that's why the practice of using the bible is so important because then we uh, we have bibles on our phone but if we make the habit of using our our bibles our proper bibles of the books 
then that is a better habit because that keeps us off the phone and that keeps the devil away from distracting us. So but what happens when we use these, uh, these mobile Bibles, uh, we tend to scroll between, you know, pages like we sometimes keep our, our various apps open. We keep the mobile app open and we keep our Zoom open and then we keep our Bible app open. So we are switching between Bible and uh, and uh, and the Zoom app. But that can, you know, also make you switch into other apps like, you know, Facebook or Instagram. And while you're, while you're listening to your Zoom session, you can also go on switching and checking your Facebook page. And that's a devil's way of distracting us. And he comes like that very often so you know it's sometimes it's good to just put your phone off just switch it off completely and then take your bible in the hand because the minute your phone is on if you have a beep from your message from your whatsapp messenger then you tend to leave your bible down and again go to your whatsapp to check your message so basically the phone is a very distracting uh, gadget uh, because we are using it for everything today for our email for everything like we have even given up our computers because we don't want to log on to our computer so we find the phone more easier so, you know, the devil has ways of getting us. So even if, though we are trying so hard to resist him, he comes through all sorts of uh, ways, like, you know, and he'll keep on distracting us, keep on taking us away from uh, reading the word of God. So that's what he does. So uh, if we can sometimes, you know, just put our phones off for certain hours in the day and, you know, give that time to Jesus, especially if you're at home in the afternoon, just put the phone off or put it away, or put the Wi-Fi, put it on silent and, you know, keep it low so that we don't check our messages. So that's one way that we can use, but uh, that is uh, when we become addicted also to looking at me. There are many people who are doing nothing, even while they are sitting in the company of others in a restaurant, they are on their phones, you know, they are being antisocial and not even talking to the, the people present there because they're so addicted to their phones. So that's a, these are the ways that the devil can gain access to us. So we need to be uh, uh, aware of all these things and, you know, and, and control them, you know, when we can. So if you are being too addicted on the television, watching too many programs, we need to cut that down. If you're watching too much on our phone, we need to cut them down. So another point is like, you know, extreme fatigue in spiritual setting. So we can all experience fatigue after a long day's work and we might drift off uh, when we attend church or prayer service. So even the disciples fell asleep in the garden of Gethsemane, uh, despite Jesus telling them to stay awake and pray. So one of uh, St. Paul's listeners fell asleep while preaching and, and St. Paul had to bring him back from the dead. So sometimes we go on, go for retreats, which begin very early in the morning. Like if you go to Porta or somewhere, it's at five o'clock in the morning if you get up. So very early in the morning and it is a rare participant who does not doze off at some point or the other. So at some point or the other, everyone will go to sleep. However, we find ourselves yawning uncontrollably every time we participate in a worship service. Or oh, sometimes when we pick up our Bible, suddenly, you know, we will feel very sleepy and we want to go to sleep. So then we might sleep even on our Bible. So that's what Satan does to us. You know, he just puts us to sleep because he doesn't want us reading the word of God. He doesn't want us being in that spiritual setting, you know. So uh, sometimes when we pick up the Bible to read or when we sit down to pray, it, is, it could signify demonic influence at times because then we just fall asleep so there is a tendency to blame these things on the flesh you know sometimes we say oh it's just that we have had too much of food or we are feeling sleepy so that part of us that goes against what is spiritual but although the flesh desires what is contrary to the spirit so can you read galatians chapter 5 verse 17 yes sister thank you sister 5 17 for what Galatians. the flesh desires is opposed to the spirit, and what the spirit desires is opposed to the flesh. For these are opposed to each other to prevent you from doing what you want. Amen. Amen. So here clearly it says like what the flesh desires, what is contrary to the spirit, and what the spirit desires contrary. So these are these are total inability to pray or to read the word of God is almost undoubtedly demonic. So every time, so even I've had this experience, you know, sometimes I attend Bible class in the afternoon at around four o'clock and uh, invariably like, you know, in, during the class at times when I'm not sitting up straight. So also our posture matters, you know, that when we attend the Bible class, you need to be sitting at a table and, uh, you know, sitting upright because the minute we listen to a Bible class from our bed, 
it's automatically that we tend to doze off and, and that afternoon time is such a time that we can just fall asleep and you know the word of god is going on on your zoom session because people don't allow you uh, you don't come on the camera then you people don't know that you are asleep or what it is but your zoom zoom session is on and you can be doing various things that I mean, happened to me also i also done that and gone asleep gone to sleep in the afternoon so that's the devil like putting you off to sleep you know not letting you hear the word of god uh, so that's what he does. He's very cunning that way. So, uh, so you have to be very careful as to what you're doing. If you really want to hear the word of God, you need to be sitting in an upright position, being attentive, you know, and keep your phone on a table so that you don't uh, pick it up and scroll during the session and keep your eyes focused and your ears open. So that's when you will actually listen to the word of God. So why do de demons prevent all this from happening? See, because they get tormented by our proximity to God or our engagement in any sp spiritual activity, they don't like it. They don't want us going. They want us to be the way we were, like, you know, those sinful people who are always giving into their ways. So they don't like us getting, you know, close to God or our engagement in any spiritual activity. So this, this uh, spirit of in the story of, of the Gerasene uh, demonic implored Jesus in God's name, don't torture me, he said. That, that guy called Legion, the demon called Legion, who was present in that uh, man said that in God's name, don't torture me. So they get tortured when we are praying, when we are reading the word of God, they don't like it. So that's why they always try to, you know, tell us that we are feeling sleepy and they put us to sleep. So this sleepiness, I'm sure every one of you all must have, you know, experienced that when you all are listening to the word of God, you'll fall asleep. Or if you're <clears throat> reading your Bibles, you all will fall asleep. So this is the devil's way of stopping us. So consequently, they try to restrict spiritual activity by causing tremendous fatigue. It's a sure, shine, uh, a sure a sign of uh, this is how quickly the fatigue or sleeplessness disappears when we turn on the TV or move to another activity. So you'll come to know that, you know, uh, it's a sure sign when, when you're reading the Bible, you're falling asleep. When you're listening to the word of God or you're, you're attending a Bible class, you're falling asleep. But the minute the Bible class gets over and your, and your favorite program comes on TV, you're wide awake because that is all not spiritual. And, you know, so the devil loves it when you're listening to all that nonsense on TV. So he's very happy and he keeps you alert and active. But so this, these are the signs that you should come to know that, you know, you have been, you have been uh, these forces are trying to attack you. So always uh, sit up straight when you're, you're listening to the word of God. Even if you're reading your Bible, try to sit on a table and a chair, uh, not on your bed. So most of us like to be on our beds and we like to pick up the Bible. Even I do it at times. I'm not saying that I don't do it. Even I do it at times. But then I've realized that I'm always falling asleep and I'm reading the Bible on the bed. So a good idea is to sit at your desk and, you know, read the Bible. So then the other point, the next point is extreme restlessness in a spiritual setting. So yawning is not only a, uh, only uh, is not the only sign of uh, demonic influence. Extreme restlessness is also an indicator. So sometimes the restlessness is accompanied by facial tics or like you know movements or grimaces, like you know sudden body jerks, or sometimes we are like writing and wriggling both internal and external. So the victim often has a strong desire to leave the environment. So you'll notice that people become, you know, restless in a spiritual setting. Like if you go take them for a prayer meeting and, you know, the demons will not want to be there. So they get up and they leave the prayer meeting or if they go to some place, they don't want to because of praise and worship and all. They find it boring, they leave. So I, I also had an experience once when I'd gone to Tabor and, you know, that was long back, many years back when I was younger. And I went there, I was not used to that the form of praise and worship and we had gone to actually stay there and uh, for, for the three-day retreat but we packed our bags and we came back so that was that's a sign of you know extreme restlessness in the spiritual that when the the demons won't allow you to even go and you know be in a spiritual setting like that way so sometimes when you are too much in sin and you're you know that's when they want to keep you there keep you in that place like even now and coming to the word of god like there's so much of a that so much of battle that you're facing because the devil doesn't want you to come out of that place where he had kept you for so many years. He wants you to be there. He doesn't want you to become this new creation. He wants the old man to be there, the old man who's in sin. He doesn't want the new creation. He just wants you to be back. There. So he tries all sorts of tactics to get you back. You know, all the all your past sins that you used to do, he, he starts bringing back slowly and 
minute by minute he will start tempting you then again you need to renew your mind and get back into the word so that's what you have to do always continuously renew your mind be be rooted in jesus be yoked to jesus and keep your eyes focused on jesus so that's what we need to do so the <clears throat> the main aim that god the father wants from each one of us is to be in the image and likeness of his son and how do we get that by you know constantly being rooted in being uh, linked to the to the vine we are the branches and jesus is the vine so we need to be attached firmly to that vine and you know we need to be in jesus and the main cause that we go away from jesus is because of sin so sin is one of the major things and all of us are called to be holy and that's uh, that's the ultimate aim of the father is to make all of us holy so that the triune god you know resides in us and then the kingdom of heaven is in us we have the kingdom within us so that's that's the ultimate goal ultimate aim that we all become holy and we have the, we are all mini christ walking on this earth and that's what would bring jesus faster uh, back again because his second coming is coming any time but for that the gospel needs to be preached to the ends of the earth and that's why there are a lot of lay people like you and me and uh, you know preaching the gospel today because that's what happened even so many kids are preaching the gospel there are non christians preaching the gospel why because the gospel has to go out to the ends of the earth so that that is our commission that each of us need to see that we are going out and taking that gospel even though we are facing this uh, spiritual warfare which is going on and in our families everywhere but the devil is trying his best to stop all this but we need to go forward because we are come at that time where we all need to do what we are commissioned to do in our in our own little way maybe we can't do it in a big way but at least in a little way we can each put in you know uh, some part and uh, you know take the gospel to the ends of the world so the next point is extreme hostility in a spiritual environment so there can be an uh, extreme displays of hostility in a spiritual environment so i have had uh, like sometimes people stare at you with open hostility on several occasions you know suppose a, like a preacher is preaching you'll find people staring at them so uh, there was an experience when a woman came and after a session was open over and said repeatedly i want to kill you you know so that's that's like an open hostility that's the demonic attack on on that preacher you know so jesus uh, on one occasion jesus and his apostles went to capernaum and when the sabbath came jesus went into the synagogue and began to teach us so can you read mark chapter 1 verses 21 to 26 yes sister so you can open your bibles to mark chapter 1 verses 21 to 26 21 to 26 they went to capernaum and when the sabbath came he entered the synagogue and taught they were astounded at his teaching for he taught them as one having authority and not as the scribes just then there was in the synagogue a man with the unclean spirit and he cried out what have you to do with us jesus of nazareth have you come to destroy us i know who you are the holy one of god but jesus rebuked him saying be silent and come out of him and the unclean spirit convulsing him and crying with a loud voice came out of him amen amen so see he said uh, jesus uh, the these unclean spirits these demon these demons they always recognize jesus so and he said to him what do you want with me jesus of nazareth have you come to destroy us and he said i know who you are they always know who jesus is so i know who you are the holy one of god so jesus just told him be quiet come out of him so the impure spirit you know uh, he shook the man violently like and came out of him with a shriek that is with a cry so notice how the man was in the synagogue he was in a place of worship so we can also there are there are people going to the churches and all who can be demon possessed it's not that uh, and being demon possessed is not such a bad thing we have to only recognize that we are demon possessed and then we need to get out of it by you know Uh, renewing our mind so it's it's not even if you feel that you are demon possessed if you recognize such a trait don't get worried about it and don't feel bad about it because all of us at some time or the other are possessed you know by, are caught by demons and the demons are possessing us and so we need to recognize these traits so that we can correct them and we can get out of them so this man was in a place of worship but he was quiet until jesus who had sent the uh, uh, who who was sent to set the captives free 
began to speak. So when he began to speak, that is when the word of God was being spoken. And then he manifested. So it's basically they manifest only when the word of God is spoken. So it's the spoken word of God that made him manifest. So how was he quiet before? Perhaps because the spirits had kept him distracted or otherwise occupied. But the spirit couldn't help but manifest in the presence of Jesus. So that's what happens when the, even when the Holy Spirit is present in a person and the person is preaching, people can manifest because that's what happens to the demons. And even if you go to like, you know, there used to be a, People like uh, fathers, like Father Rufus, who's to come before he's dead now. He's uh, passed away now. But there's also, uh, there are fathers who do these exorcism. So when these demons come, even I've gone to churches when they had these services. And then there were people rolling on the floor, frotting from the mouth, you know. So we don't know that we have demons possessing us. But these can manifest when we are in the presence of God, you know. And when the Holy Spirit is present. So we can need to come to know them. And these people need to be set free. So even if it is one of us then we need to be set free. So we should be able to recognize all these, how these demons, you know, infiltrate uh, in, uh, and come into us. So that is what we need to know, uh, basically. And that's what all these teachings are all about, so that we know about the demons and we know how to recognize them. So the next point is like intrusive and compulsive voices in your head. Sometimes you have these voices in your head. So during the Last Supper, uh, sister, can you read John chapter 13, verse 2? The devil had already put it into the heart of Judas, son of Simon Iscariot, to betray him. And during supper, Esther. So in this passage, thank you, sister. So in this passage, during the last supper, scripture speaks about how the evening meal was in progress and the devil had already prompted Judas, the son of Simon Iscariot, to betray Jesus. So the devil had already prompted him. So the devil can plant thoughts in our heads. So many of us are surely acquainted with lustful thoughts when we encounter somebody we find attractive, you know. So the devil is already planting these lustful thoughts into our head when we see somebody that, somebody that we like, you know, we find attractive. But he can plan all kinds of thoughts like from blasphemy to hatred and in extreme cases, even more wicked thoughts prompting us to rape and murder. So this is what happens is when people do such acts like rape, murder, it's the devil, you know, prompting them. So if we permit ourselves to be influenced, he can push us to do some crazy and evil things. So we should all, always, you know, be aware of what thoughts we are thinking. You know, that's why they say hatred, anger, jealousy you know, are not good thoughts. Because it, it, it leads us to doing a lot of bad things. So that's once we get these thoughts, we need to just, you know, take it away with the word of God. So all these thoughts, even looking at someone lustfully is a sin. So that's what we, then we have, you know, men have this thought of, you know, raping people because they look at them lustfully and already the devil is planting that thought that, you know, you need to rape them. So that's when they do these crimes and then they are put behind bars. So there's another, another point is extreme blasphemy. That is, you know, writing or speaking about God in a way that shows lack of respect or vulgarity. So this is another point where, you know, changes in, uh, in your behavior when the name of Jesus is mentioned or when one speaks about the fate is another sign of demonic influence. There are some people who don't want to listen to the word of God. They don't want to know anything about Jesus. They, they just don't want to listen to you. And they'll just tell you to stop and they don't want you to start talk about Jesus, you know. Even if you're just generally talking, there are some people who will readily listen. But there are many people who just don't want. So this is another sign of demonic influence. The person under such influence offers, often alters vulgar profanities or display irrational anger. Sometimes they will even curse God. Oh, you and your God, you're always talking about God. Or they'll tell you something like that. Or they'll, they'll curse God, you know, that because of your speaking about. So if you notice this about yourself, you need deliverance, you know, if you if you can't stand the word of God. So if you notice this in other people also, we need to pray about it. So do not continue the conversation. If, if when you're talking about God or you're trying to tell somebody about Jesus and they are not ready to listen, just to stop the conversation. It's better not to continue because, you know, you just aggravate them, but you need to pray for those people. Instead of continuing the conversation, pray about them so that they, they will be able to listen to the word of God, that the Holy Spirit touches their lives. So, it, uh, Sister, can you read Matthew chapter 7, verse 6? Yes. Yeah, 
Do not give what is holy to dogs and do not throw your pearls before swine or they will trample them underfoot and turn and maul you. Amen. Amen. So it, here, it clearly says here, do not give dogs what is sacred. Do not throw your pearls to pigs. If you do, they may trample them under the feet and turn and tear you to pieces. So when you're getting this sort of reaction, when you're trying to tell somebody about Jesus, just stop and, you know, just let it be. Change the conversation because, you know, they don't want to hear anything about Jesus. And, you know, there'll come a time when they will come to you themselves or, you know, there'll be an opportunity for you to talk about Jesus. But don't push it. Just leave it at that. So there's another, the other point is intense hatred and jealousy. So intense and irrational hatred and jealousy are often signs of demonic spirits. So they can lead to murder. So we have an example with King Saul, where an evil spirit got into him and he hurled his fear at David, who loved him as a son, loved his father. And, he, and then Saul made it his life's mission to kill uh, David, his life's mission to kill David. So what happened? One day when David was entering the city after winning a battle, Saul heard the people chanting, Saul has killed thousands, but David has killed tens of thousands. So the spirit of jealousy entered him. And instead of combating the spirit, he gave into it. So we need to combat these spirits of jealousy that come. So do we have a habit of gossiping and slandering people? It's, that's a very bad habit. So that's something that we all have to stop. Even me, like sometimes, you know, we tend to get into a conversation where people are talking about someone instead of stopping them or, or moving away from that place, we sit down there and we, you know, uh, we involve ourselves in that conversation. So that's as bad as the person talking. So do we have this habit of gossiping and slandering people? We need to stop it. So this could be a result of a spirit of hatred and jealousy. So if the person talking about somebody else, it could be a result of spirit of hatred or jealousy. What more effective way to murder somebody than destroy their reputation? So gossiping is something that, you know, we all need to get out of this habit. So in some, some time or the other, we are always gossiping about people. So, if, so the best thing is when you start and you, and you know it's going to lead to a gossip is just to change the sub subject or to move away. So that's how we can learn to control gossiping because gossiping is bad. So jealousy is the pain that arises when someone has something you don't have or what you think you need to be for example, if I'm jealous of someone, someone's like, you know, or someone's farmhouse, they have a beautiful farmhouse. It's because I believe I need a beautiful farmhouse to be fully satisfied. Or if I'm jealous of someone's athletic abilities, because I believe I need more athletic ability to be fully satisfied. So if I'm jealous of someone's fame, it is because I believe I need more fame to be fully satisfied. So when I'm jealous, the problem lies in my faith. I'm not trusting Jesus' promise that he himself will fully satisfy me. So he gave us this promise in John chapter 6, verse 35, where he said to them, I am the bread of life. Whoever comes to me will never be hungry. And whoever believes in me will never be thirsty. So Jesus has given us this promise. We need to cling to this promise. And he's always going to, uh, you know, we are never going to be hungry or thirsty if we have Jesus in our life. So, and I'm trusting that something else will satisfy me more than Jesus. So that's when I, I you know, get this jealous uh, feeling when I'm trusting that something else will satisfy me more. Than, but if I'm satisfied with Jesus, Jesus, I don't need to be jealous on anything. So sin is the re root cause. So the, what you need to do when you, you, you are in sin, you need to confess and repent and, you know, ask for forgiveness. So that is one thing that we all need to do is, Repent once we are sinning and ask for forgiveness and don't go back to that sin again. So there are also very negative attitudes, which are another point like negative attitudes. So negative attitudes such as bitterness, you know, criticism, uh, contempt for authority, rejection and unforgiveness are also signs of demonic spirits. So all these can be signs of demonic spirits. So we need to be aware like, you know. So unforgiveness can lead to several other spirits taking control of our lives. So unforgiveness is something that is really, really bad because the thing is, we become so bitter when we, we can't forgive, you know. Sometimes uh, we just want, we don't want to forgive people because they have hurt us so much. But why is that hurt? Because we are expecting things from those people. So the idea not to feel hurt, brothers and sisters, is to not expect anything out of anybody. You know, all we need to be focused is on Jesus and he gives us everything that we need. So when we are expecting a thank you from something, somebody that we have given a gift to, then we are going to feel hurt because that person is not going to say thank you. So when you're giving something, also give it with nothing, uh, getting nothing back in return. That's when you should give 
with getting nothing back in return. So that's when you never feel disappointed. So be that person doesn't thank you or the person doesn't say sorry or not bother because you're not expecting it. So why would you get affected by it? You know, so I have learned this and I have never like had this feeling of hurt. Now I don't have this feeling of hurt anymore because I don't expect anything from anybody. And I'm just content with what I have. So I also tell, you know, people like if you're giving a gift, give it with your whole heart. Don't give it because you want or because it's a birthday person or because that person gave me this gift for my birthday. I have to give back something with the equal amount for that. But no, a person is giving you a gift because they love you and, you know, they want to give you a gift. If they're giving it uh, to you because they want something back in return, then they should not be giving you that gift. And it's better not to accept gifts like that. Because the thing is, uh, when you want to give a gift to a person, it doesn't have to be their birthday or any special. You can give a gift to a person at any time. It doesn't have to be a present itself. It could be any gift, you know, a gift in prayer, anything. You can give it at any time to a person. So when you, when you get hurt and you can't forgive people, it's because your expectations are always high. So remember to keep, you know, your expectations to a zero because you don't need to expect anything from anybody because ultimately they're going to hurt you. So if you don't want to be hurt, just be happy with what you have and, you know, don't expect. So unforgiveness can lead to several other spirits taking control of our lives, eventually leading to physical ailments. So often, like, you know, when we can't forgive these ailments that come like cancer and all, we are like, you know, we are rotting inside because we are not forgiven. But everybody is not like that who has cancer. There are some very, you know, you, you can't make out. But these they say these, these uh, physical ailments which take place, like, you know, uh, often like we need to let go of unforgiveness I mean, it's always not the case but sometimes it could be the case so very often we forgive our offenders we find ourselves healed of physical sicknesses because forgiveness breaks several strongholds the enemy has built in our hearts and our minds so remember when we are unforgiving it is not us and un being unforgiving it's the devil who is making a stronghold in your mind and and is not letting you forgive that person so this devil is very cunning it's all him doing all these all these bad things that we keep in our mind. It's only the devil's activity, you know, who's who's making a stronghold of hatred, you know, unforgiveness, all these things, anger, bitterness, all the devil is making. So get rid of it because then you should know that you are the devil is possessing you at once. Go, you know, even if the person is not ready to forgive you, never mind, but you forgive that person. So at least from your side, you know, your slate is clean. You don't have to tell Jesus that I forgive that person totally. And if you can, if you see that person, you can smile at that person. Doesn't mean that you have to go back being friendly with the people who have hurt you. You also need to be on your guard and weary of, you know, not getting hurt again. So you need to keep that a little guard on yourself. But there's no harm in saying a hi or hello or a simple, you know, a small conversation and move on. It doesn't mean that you have to go back to those people, very people who are hurting you again and again. No, you can, you can keep your boundaries. But be cordial also so that's the way that you can you know let go of all this unforgiveness and another point is sickness without diagnosis or cure or that you know that run in the family so sickness that doctors have been able to diagnose or cure on the on that run in the family from generation to generation you know sometimes sicknesses run in the family from generation to generation and often being of spiritual influences so that sickness can have a spiritual root can be seen in scripture so, sister, can you read Luke chapter 13, verses 10 to 11? Yes. Sister. Luke 13. Now he was teaching in one of the synagogues on the Sabbath. And behold, there was a woman who had had a disabling spirit for 18 years. She was bent over and could not fully straighten herself. Thank you, when sister. So on the Sabbath, you just still read one more, sister? Yeah. When Jesus saw her, he called her over and said to her, Woman, you are freed from your disability. Amen. Amen. Thank you, sister. So on a Sabbath, Jesus was teaching in one of the synagogues and a woman was there for crippled for 18 years. So uh, these spiritual influence, like I said, sickness without a uh, without cure or that run in the family from generation to generation. So these sicknesses also could have like a uh, be of, uh, of spiritual influences. So she had like a demon. So he just told her and she was free. Like, you know, a woman who was there being crippled for 18 years. Scripture also speaks about how God anointed Jesus of Nazareth with the Holy Spirit and power and how he went around doing good and healing all those who were under the power of the devil because God was with him. This is mentioned in Acts chapter 10, 
verse 38 so jesus had that power to to heal people you know who are under the power of the devil so the so same way with us we are also given that same power that jesus had if with the help of the holy spirit we also can do the same works that jesus did so that's what we need to go out and do you know to be healed and to heal people so there's also another uh, point is called a uh, paranormal activity so this it is beyond the scope of the study to look at this paranormal activity which cannot be explained by science or reason and that seems to be strange or mysterious activity activity but this feature would not be complete without mentioning that these can be manis- manifestations of evil around us so if you experience like this paranormal activity you need to consult your your church you know the the, the priest from your church so these kind of activities cannot be done by us but we need to contact somebody from the, from the church like a priest so what are the solutions to all of this now as we come to the end of this uh, topic uh, what are the uh, this uh, today's topic uh, most of the time uh, turning to jesus solves these issues so the solution to all these recognizing most of the time turning to jesus solves these issues so in our next session uh, on self deliverance we will seek his help in deliverance so in most cases self deliverance will give us the freedom we seek it might take a few weeks for our situations to be fully resolved but a disciplined application of the treatment will have the desired uh, result so you could also go for a you know for a retreat a five day retreat or closed door retreat which will help in the, if the problems persist if you have if you are aware that you have these demonic you know attacks you could uh, attend a retreat you know sometimes locked in continuous prayer and the word of god for a period of time long period of time will send the demons fleeing for their life so that's why when we go for retreats like a seven day retreat and we come back completely cleansed because these demons have all just uh, run away from our lives you know so in that event uh, unlikely event the problem river if the problem re- remains unsolved then counsel with people who have the gift of deliverance so you need to go to like a a, parish, a priest who has the gift of deliverance like in bombay we have father ashlin chand who who does this also so you can go and like you know meet him if you are not getting uh, delivered from the devils but the the, the best thing to do is be continuously renewing your mind being in the word of god so that the the devil hates the word of god so again and again i'm mentioning to you all you know read your bibles and uh, and be constantly rooted in the word of god so the sword of the spirit and you know that will help you know wield the, we can wield that sword swiftly and make all these devils flee from our lives so uh, we come to the end of this. i'll make a short prayer before we uh, close this up this for the day in the name of the father son and the holy spirit amen lord jesus we thank you once again for your word that you shared with us today lord thank you that you uh, it is helping could help us to to know how to how these demons penetrate into our lives lord jesus sometimes we can almost sense the heaviness of pressure mounting and the presence of the darkness around us we recognize the enemy is at work again whether he's trying to discourage us or to get get us side track to fall into temptation he's always doing that lord to give us to give up or to take our eyes off you he's always hanging around lord he's always wanting us to take our eyes off you we need your supernatural power lord to stand strong and not surrender to all these schemes of the devil physical force won't help because you said the weapons of our warfare are different from those in the world as believers ours are powerful and can demolish strongholds lord and lies these supernatural weapons lord originate from you by your precious name and blood jesus we are asking you to confuse satan and cancel his attempts to shut us and our influence down help us not to become discouraged or to give in with when heavy times of testing come when we are tired and weak you are our strong lord you are our only source of help we cannot fight without you teach us how to pray and to trust you to pull down these strongholds that keep us helpless these strongholds of you know unforgiveness bitterness hatred anger jealousy guard us from the isolation that leaves us exposed and vulnerable we believe you destroy the power of the enemy by your death and resurrection lord but like a bad penny this enemy keeps showing up whispering lies twisting the truth and attempting to to infiltrate our selfish pride he never gives up lord we are declaring the devil and his demons 
liars today, Lord. Through the power of your precious name and blood, we agree with your word and the truth that you are in us and that you are greater than the enemy that wants to rule the world. The one that is in us is greater than the one that is ruling the world, who wants to rule the world. You, your word and prayer, Lord, are our secret weapon. We belong to you, Lord, and that fills us with a powerful God confidence, Lord. We want to constantly dress in the spiritual armor you gave us. Help us to use it to defend others from Satan's fiery darts as well. No one and nothing can snatch us away from your hand. Strengthen our faith, Lord. Forgive our sins so that we may be clean in your righteousness. Make us brave so that we can stand and fight the spiritual battles in our life and in our world. Give all of us present here your wisdom, your discernment, your knowledge, your counsel, your might, and the fear of the Lord so that we won't be caught off guard. Lord, thank you that your presence always goes before us as we start our day today. Together, Lord, we will win because in truth you already have. I make this prayer in Jesus' mighty and powerful name. Amen, amen, and amen. 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 Thank you, sister.